I just instinctively knew that something else was happening. And within the moments and time that I said, okay, I need to have legal representation, the FBI and the Secret Service was at my door. I wanted people to understand that she was a person, but she was a mother and she was killed and shot. Like, you should be enraged about that. She was shot in her back and she's a mother. But then it's like in the recesses of your mind, it's like, wait a minute, something like this, something happened here and this person was treated so differently. And yet you have a mob of individuals that stormed and vandalized, burglarized and theft the people's house. And they were actually given egress. The same type of gate that was being held against my sister's car to try to prevent her from driving, those type of gates were then opened for this mob on January 6th to actually enter the Capitol. in Missouri tonight. This tragic death has exposed so many fault lines in American society. See the man there jogging down the road. The killing has sparked protests and demands for arrest. Say their name. Say their name. Justice was not given in this case and that we've got to correct it. You guys see that shooting that happened two days ago? Uh, because don't worry, if you missed it, there was another one yesterday. Police two videos. Death of a black man days. inside his own Police apartment in Dallas. Shot. Incident Especially after incident. Year after year. When news flashes past and the trauma remains, whose story? What story? Her story. He wasn't no criminal. My baby was a good man. A good hard Hashtags boy. through his story. The story again the same. Until justice and truth obtained, we will always say their name. I'm Chris Colbert. Thanks for tuning in to Say Their Name, brought to you by DCP Entertainment. This series takes a deeper look into the impact of the assault and killing of Black people by the police and in Stand Your Ground states. We share the stories from families who have been negatively impacted in these situations. We did not talk to officers or to governing bodies, just the families and their support systems. We are not the court of law, nor do we try to be for legal purposes. We are not here to presume guilt or innocence for anyone. Because, quite frankly, we do not want to be sued. We simply want to give the families a voice while examining what happens when the hashtags stop and the news unfortunately moves on to the next big story. All we want to do is give the families the opportunity to control their narrative and share ways we can all help. Warning. Some of the discussions may be particularly disturbing and even emotionally overwhelming at times. When one of those moments occur that may be particularly triggering, you will hear this chime. For more specific details on the timing of these moments, please visit our show notes. On this episode of Say Their Name, we focus on Miriam Carey. Welcome to season two of Say Their Name. Uh, I'm joined here with my co-host, Adele Coleman. Hey, Adele. Hey, Chris. And we first, honestly, before we jump into things this season, really want to thank you all so much for the support in season one of Say Their Name. You know, fortunate enough to, with your support, being able to win multiple awards, being able to raise money for some of these families. Uh, Lois Donald, uh, the mother of Caldrick Donald, was able to get into a new home. So thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts and these families' hearts. Um, we hope to continue that with this new season where we're going to be focusing a lot more on the women impacted by police violence. And that's something we'll get into as we get into some future episodes. But that is something that's prevalent here in this first episode of season two of Say Their Name. We're going to be focusing on the story of Miriam Carey. And one of the big reasons why we wanted to start here is that Miriam was killed in Washington, D.C. And it has this eerie correlation and, and juxtaposition up against what we saw in the January 6th coup um, at the Capitol building of 2021. 
And I want to kick it over to you, Adele, because you were on the ground for these conversations and talking directly with Val Carey, Miriam's sister, and uh, some of her support system. You know, why did you feel like it was important for us to not only look at this case, but how it related to what happened on January 6th? I think it was important to look at this case because what happened to Miriam Carey is an important story that we should be telling. We see a lot of double standards between Miriam Carey and the January 6th insurrection. It's literally a case of, you know, recklessness versus restraint. I'm a Washingtonian. I'm a native. I grew up here my whole life. And you never really saw something like we saw the day Miriam came to Washington, where it's this narrative that by the time you turn on the TV, we don't have a lot of information of what really happened. But what we do see is this intensity around the city, this narrative of this crazy high-speed chase going on where she's trying to drive into the White House and into the Capitol and all these other falsehoods that we later learn. But at the moment, it was just like really scary and, and really intense. And, you know, the media amplified that. And especially at a time where the city was already on edge because literally a few weeks prior was the Naval Yard shooting. And so to have another quote-unquote incident or encounter or occurrence within the city where, you know, a young lady came to the city and took a wrong turn. Well, for them to run with that in such a way, I felt like it was an important story to share because it showed the double standards and the hypocrisy of when we were in actual danger and the city was actually under siege and there was an actual threat. And yet the officer showed no restraint. And we didn't see that when a black mother came to Washington, D.C. and, you know, got turned around and confused. Once again, we see recklessness and the officers not showing that same restraint. So Miriam's case is important because it highlights the hypocrisy in policing. It highlights what happens when black and brown faces and especially women are put in these unfortunate situations or come face to face with police and have these encounters and it results in them losing their lives. Mm -hmm. This case is important because Miriam Carey should not have lost her life at all. Well, as you mentioned too, you know, you're from the DC area and there's so many pieces in this that I think are relatable to kind of your experiences in the area. You, you being from DC, the fact that, you know, your husband was there on January 6th during the, the Capitol attack you as a mother, and, and that um, being a mother is something that's prevalent within this storyline as well. Can you speak to just some of those parallels that you kind of felt personally as you were talking to Val Carey about what happened to her sister? I'm grateful enough that my husband made it home that day. You know, like, it didn't result in the loss of his life. And it's really scary, and it's also heartbreaking to hear about the recklessness on behalf of the D.C. and federal and Secret Service officers just firing aimlessly into a car, you know, with this that them already kind of determining in their head, I feel like how this was going to end because it was just a lot of just recklessness around it and spreading the narrative of this false intensity that it really wasn't. And to hear about them not only just firing upon Miriam, but her daughter who was only one in the backseat of the car and just trying to flip the blame, so to say, on who was really endangering this child it's just it makes you really sad it makes me you know think about my own children and I can't say that I wouldn't have reacted the same if someone's throwing themselves on my car I'm a mama I'm not going to just kind of sit there and allow for that I'm going to try to you know fight or flight I'm going to mm -hmm. try to get out of there and you know I think about it like what else could she have done I don't really see another way other than trying to get out of the situation and get her child to safety and so I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we're watching these images on TV, it's easy to kind of say, well, I would have done this and I would have done that. But you don't really know until you're in that moment. And as a parent, the second your child is born, you want to protect that child at all costs, even if it means putting yourself in danger, you know, even if it means in a way sacrificing yourself. And I just feel like she was trying to protect her daughter and, I still feel that way, even, you know, after the they try to flip the narrative or whatever, I still feel like she was trying, you know, to protect her child because that fear of the unknown, and that's what I ran into with my husband, you know, talking to him, and then I couldn't communicate with him anymore because I think everybody's trying to call in and out. 
I don't know where he is. You see people putting up nooses and, you know, just this angry mob that's looking for people that looks like you. It's this unimaginable fear. You just want to get in protective mode and you just want to do something. And I don't think that it was anything wrong, you know, necessarily with how Miriam was trying to protect her child. Yeah, and even though this case, I think at any time somebody does something at the Capitol or in D.C., it makes this national news story. It hits the headlines. And so in this case, this was one of those stories on Miriam Carey's death that actually did make national news right out of the gate. But as you were doing research around this, were there difficult, was there difficulty trying to find information on what actually took place? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. There's literally only one video from a network that's not an American network that they had at the time. And it, and it doesn't, it's, that video doesn't even show, you know, everything that happens. It just kind of shows her at Garfield Circle, but it doesn't, it doesn't show, it's just her kind of driving like 20 miles per hour getting chased down the street. And it doesn't show the whole thing, you know, from beginning to end. And then the police officers' names have never been released to this day. And what a lot of people don't know about, especially in downtown D.C., there are cameras everywhere, everywhere, on the poles, on the street lights. There, You're on camera. The federal buildings, the museums, you are always on camera. And the fact that there is no video footage, really, or if you find a video footage, it's a, it's a dead link. If you're searching the names, it's a dead link. There's a document that Val shared, and literally the whole document is blacked out because everything has been redacted. Like, they are trying to protect their officers at all costs, and I feel like that's because they know that that it was wrong, like how they, they handled everything. Because even, like, with the initial narrative, like I spoke about earlier, you know, it was this crazed woman came down, and she had all these theories. They were too busy trying to you know, find a narrative to to discredit Miriam in a lot of ways instead of just kind of taking accountability, like, you know, for their part. Because at the time where she turned in, you know, it, it wasn't restricted. or And it's a confusing area, and she tried to turn around. But you don't hear any of that. All you hear about is the narrative that they wanted to push forward. It's like once they decided what the narrative was, they pushed it out to the media, and it was gone. And... There is literally very limited evidence to to even find in your research. It, it takes a lot of digging. We found some, but you hit a lot of dead links. And, and to this day, you know, we don't know the officer's names. We see a picture of the back of his head. Mm-hmm. We don't even know what his face looks like. Well, in, in this episode, we focus a lot on, on just talking directly to Val Carey, Miriam's sister. And... I think it also gives us such a unique perspective, especially in this episode, because Val is many things. But one of the things that she is is a former law enforcement officer herself. What was it like being able to have this kind of conversation with somebody who was impacted by police violence, who is also a former law enforcement officer themselves? I think it's such a unique position that Val's in in general, especially in this day and age where we we it's like two sides. It's like you're either police or you're a victim. And to have her be both, I felt like it was so unique because we got to dive deeper into understanding policies. You know, we don't go talk to officers. That's our whole thing. We don't talk to the media. We talk to the, we don't talk to officers. We talk to the families. And to have a family member who is a cop say, okay, this, this is what I would have done. This is how it should have been done. This is how the police should have acted. This is how I was supported by my local fellow police officers. You know, it... it it, it helped kind of move the story and also push it further to understand that officers don't have to go to such extremes every time. Val was a sergeant and she didn't have to go to all of these extremes to kind of get the results that she needed for people to kind of fall in line or to disarm situations. And then for that to be her sister, it, it turned on two switches because She wanted to investigate this as an officer to find the truth, but also get to the core of it all as what the heck happened to my sister and why. Yeah, I think we have such a unique story to tell here. And and without further ado, let's uh, let's hear about Miriam Carey. Adele and I start our Say Their Name journey in the Bed-Stuy home of Val Carey, retired NYPD sergeant, business owner and activist. But of all of her titles, she is most known for the one that compelled her to begin her fight for justice. Big sister to Miriam Carey. <laughs> so in the household, there were five girls. Um, 
is I, I have two brothers and a sister who didn't live with us. Um, but in the household, was five girls, and Miriam was younger than me. She's number four. You know, it's interesting. I don't even know the word I'm trying to use, but the positions of children, like the first child is kind of like the test run child. I was the second child, and then Amy was the third. So for a minute, I was a, I was a middle child until Miriam came along. My mother and her birthday are seven days apart. <laughs> and I still feel like a middle child. But I feel like Miriam and Andrea, the, the smaller two, they got, they got something different from my mom than the first three. They got away with a whole lot more. <laughs> okay, so we grew up in East New York. It was very, very tough. And we grew up in one of the toughest projects in East New York, which was Pink Houses. So during the 90s, you know, I grew up in the 80s, 90s. My duration of time is like a little bit, seven years ahead of her. But at any rate, yeah, very, very, very tough neighborhood. Interestingly enough, the dynamics of the neighborhood being, it being like a rough neighborhood, we as, you know, some people would refer to us as the Carrie sisters, them Carrie girls. Uh, <laughs> we seem to thrive in our own space, you know, and um, and it was, you know, Brooklyn. We had friends in in that area. We were good girls. We were smart. We were labeled smart. So when you grow up with so many sisters in the house, and we're all sisters, and your sister might like something that you have, and it becomes theirs. <laughs> Like, okay, where's my bag? Miriam was good for, like, commandeering, like, my accessories as a little sister. So it's, like, my designer bag she's going to high school with. Like, I w I've left, I left things at home base. And then I'll come over, like, hey, isn't that my bag? <laughs> One thing I could say, you, you never ran out of pads. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> my mom is from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and my dad is from Mississippi. Oh, my gosh. Um, my mom moved to New York many, many moons ago, back in the 60s. She came up here from uh, Baton Rouge when she was about 19. And she came up as a domestic. She was working for uh, white families out on Long Island. And I don't know how she met my father, but somehow here in New York, I don't know, maybe in Harlem or something like that. My mom went to the, the Apollo or something. And um, she met my father. My father was a really good cook. Actually, my father taught my mother how to cook. My father's profession was a cook. So us cook. Our responsibilities was to wash the dishes. We would have a chart of who had to wash the dishes. <laughs> this week, it was Amy. This week, it was Valerie. But again, Miriam, like there was, when Miriam was 14, I was 21. I was already out the house. So when I was 18, she was 11. It was just, you know, there was a, a gap. So growing up, with that gap, it wasn't so much like, like I was her big sister. I took care of her. And then I moved out uh, while she was, you know, still growing up. But that's home base. You know, whether you, you move out of mom's place, it's still home base. You always go back. Like holidays, like my mother, my father, they, we celebrated holidays. So Christmas was very big in my house. Easter was very big in my house. Christmas Eve, we got to open up one gift. Just thinking about the years, again, there was times when Miriam was the baby, and then Andrea, my other sister, came after her, and they're three years apart. Thanksgiving was definitely centered around food. We always had, like, a nice little spread and cakes. And so for Easter growing up, we would have Easter baths. We would go to church. Very interesting. Like, 
we were brought up with a duality. Like, my father was Catholic, my mother was Baptist. And so it was like they left it up to us to figure out what religion we wanted to follow. So we would go to St. Fortunata Church for service, for Mass, and then we would go to True Worship Church after. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we would do that. But, you know, Catholic Church, it was an hour, if that. But then we would spend the rest of the day in church. (laughs) The importance and love of the holidays and family was something the Carey family carried with them into adulthood, especially sisters Val, Amy, and Miriam. Well, once we left Mommy's house, then we were cooking. So... Um, and everyone had kind of had their own style of cooking, and, and then Miriam would host, you know, dinner at her house. And of course, she wanted to—I don't want to say impress us with her cooking, but you know, there's always who makes the best macaroni, and you know, everyone loves my deviled eggs. She actually did make a good macaroni. She made a good one, not as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> So I think as we got older, it became the core three, Amy, Miriam, and Val. So it was like, oh, so now she's old enough to hang out and (laughs) old enough to go to parties with us. Miriam was very outgoing. She definitely loved her family. She was into fashion. She was into traveling. She was into entertaining, and I'm smiling because I remember it was years ago, she had uh, put together a party in the city at one of these clubs, and, you know, I'm a creative person, like, I love crafts and stuff like that. We would do a lot of partying together. It's funny because it's like she tried to, I don't want to say be like me, in ways, but as an older sister, you know, you look up to your older sister, it's like, oh, well, Val entertains, Val does this. So now she gets her own, you know, brownstone apartment. She wants to have her Halloween party at her house and her New Year's Eve party at her house. Oh, I'm going to show you some pictures of the New Year's Eve party. (laughs) Those are like some of the more uh, happier memories So I remember the Halloween party that she had at her house. I remember that because I wore, (laughs) I wore Hillary Clinton face, (laughs) a Hillary Clinton face mask over there. And yeah, so when she got her place um, here, she started doing events, well, parties at her house. She would throw like parties like in event spaces. So, and then collaborate with me to be like part of the decor. She would promote the party. Um, so yeah, we we just like to have a good time and entertain and to be able to assist your sister, you know, with something that she's doing. I just want to show this. Val shares an aged photo album full of various photos of her and her sisters at a party. Their warm smiles matching. This is from Kwanzaa 2005. And I'm laughing because I know, like, my husband's probably in the other room right now, like, doing this, like, oh, the Kwanzaa party. (laughs) It's like, this is the infamous Kwanzaa party. But at this party, I had people write, like, what their purpose was because this Kwanzaa party took place on Nia, means purpose. So the idea of this was I took pictures before like where we're at digitally. So you, we're still like printing out pictures and stuff like that. I still print out pictures, I'm so old school. But I had everyone because I knew that I was taking pictures of them, but I was gonna take pictures and then put the picture next to what they wrote. And unfortunately it it was in some place that got like water damage, but I still have this photo. It's me and that's Amy and that's Mary. So yeah, at this particular party, and she wrote, you can read it. So did you want to read it? 
<laughs> was that going to be powerful if you read it? Okay, so Miriam goes 2006. Complete spring semester at Brooklyn College, which he did. Buy a car, which he did. Better money management. Take anesthesia course at NYU in March. Go on a vacation. And she did. She did all that. And the last sentence that she wrote was, Valerie is my blood sister and close friend. Goal-driven, Miriam wrote out her plans for her future in a memory book at the infamous Kwanzaa party. One of her biggest goals, becoming a registered dental hygienist. So Miriam was very charming, charismatic. She had a beautiful smile, friendly, outgoing. I don't think that it changed. I think that it just... um. You know, I don't, it couldn't evolve. It just expanded into adulthood and um, very, very uh, determined, like goal oriented, driven. You know, if you had a goal, it's like, okay, this is what I want to do. And it's like, okay, well, how can I figure out to make this happen? She went to Clara Barton High School, and Clara Barton is a uh, high school for health. So somewhere in between there, she realized what she wanted to do. Um, like I said, my mom was in healthcare. Um, Amy is in healthcare. Amy started out as a dietitian and then became a registered nurse. And Amy went to Clara Barton also. So I, I think following Amy to Clara Barton maybe perhaps could have been something that inspired her. I mean, she loved her work. In dentistry, was very, very proud of being a RDH, a registered dental hygienist. Her friends would joke about her getting a license plate with the RDH on the back because she was very, very proud of that accomplishment. I was really proud of her. I was there to assist her in any sort of way. You know, I watched her study. She studied hard when she needed me to fill in and be a, a patient for her. Like, yeah, you can work on my teeth. <laughs> Brush my teeth. <laughs> I remember going up to host those college for that. When she was going for her boards and she had to do her clinics and I was one of her patients, I'm smiling because <laughs> it is so funny to me. Um, I remember being one of her patients that they worked on and her friends and, you know, they were like, oh, is this your younger sister? And I'm like, younger sister, but I was actually seven years older than Miriam. Uh, she definitely wouldn't want to be a cop because, you know, she's very, like, somewhat dainty-like, you know, and not as, I don't want to say rough around the edges. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Val's referring to how even though her sisters Miriam and Amy, and even her mother, were all in health care, to her and her family's surprise, Val decided to go a different route by becoming a police officer, though that wasn't the initial plan. Dreams deferred, like a raisin <laughs> in the sun. <laughs> okay, so um, I really wanted to be a lawyer. And I did take like, you know, I was on this path of, I'm going to be a lawyer taking, you know, law classes and since junior high school. And then as a teen, I went on a retreat with a local councilwoman from East New York, Priscilla Wooten, whom during this retreat for the youth that she took um, upstate, they had a law workshop. And so I was thinking that it was an actual law workshop along the lines of mock trial law, but it was actually a recruitment. They had two cops there recruiting people to take the test. And I was 17 at the time, and they convinced me. And I was telling them, ah, I don't want to be a cop. I want to be a lawyer. And they were like, you could still be a lawyer and be a cop at the same time. And you can get 28 college credits just for going through the academy. So I'm thinking like, oh, 
that's a short curb, <laughs> you know? And that's how I became a cop with the intention of still following the track of becoming a lawyer, but I got caught up into the track of being a cop. And her family's reaction. You know, um, it's interesting. I don't think they actually saw that one coming. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, cool. You know, she's a cop. and But I didn't realize how much they worried, like my mom and my daughter. And like, they actually worried about me being on a job. And, you know, I had a lot of instances where I got hurt on a job. And, you know, the job would be like, oh, you're going to call your mom. I'm like, no, don't call her. Like, it was just a car accident, you know. I think they were very proud when I became a sergeant. You know, everyone was there for my promotion. And as the position of a sergeant, you're able to affect change in a different way. Some things officers have discretion over. And things can go one way or the other at the discretion of an officer. Unfortunately, some officers use their discretion more so towards people that look like them as opposed to people who don't look like them. And there's this one particular incident that I, I can recall as a sergeant that made me feel as if I, I kind of gotten through to a kid because there was a kid who, it was during school hours, he pretty much jumped the turnstile, but it was during school hours. I don't know if he had a train pass or not, but the officer brought him into the station to actually give him a desk appearance ticket, which would then generate an arrest record. Um, whereas this was a summonsable offense and you didn't have to give him a DAT, a desk appearance ticket. And I said, what you're gonna do is you're gonna run his name through the system to see if he has any warrants he doesn't have any warrants, then he's going to get a summons. And But this particular officer felt the need to teach this young person a lesson because of his bravado. Like, oh, he was, you know, disrespecting me. Disrespect is not criminal. Someone could take uh, a profanity as a disrespect. And because I was profane to you, now you feel the need to put an arrest record on me? That's not, that's not just, that's not fair. And as a desk officer, I was, I was in a position to tell this officer, no, you're not going to give him a DAT. You're gonna give him a summons. And then I had to have a heart to heart with this young man. And I told him, I said, you're lucky that someone like me is at the desk that sees you because as a child, as a kid, as a teenager, we try to impress our friends. And sometimes you're, when you're impressing your friends, you're actually hurting yourself. And if you don't have people, mentors that are guiding you, you could ruin your chances at having a good career or a good life. You know, it's with a marring, a, a scar that's marking you. You know, whereas now, you don't have any other incidences that occur after this, but now you've matured and now you want to go for the city job. And it's like, oh, you were arrested. Even if you ultimately get past that and explain, why would you have to go through all of that explanation if you, one, just do right? And so while you may feel that this officer approached you the wrong way, but you initially or fair evasion and you know your interaction with the officer if he asks you for your ID give him your ID don't start trying to you know act out because your friends are watching like oh I'm not going to be a punk you're going to be a punk with an arrest record now you know so yeah I, I don't know what has happened to that kid I don't know if he um has graduated or has ever gotten arrested after. But I know on that day, during that time, coming into my precinct, he didn't get an arrest record. And I explained to him it could have went a different way because someone else 
could have just said, you know, the cop would have came in with him. Oh, Sarge, I'm going to give him a DAT. And the cop, the, the sergeant, not caring about that kid. I cared about him because he's in my community. Like, it takes a village to raise a child. And I also, I do mentoring outside of um, all the other stuff that I do. I'm part of Brooklyn Cares Mentoring Movement, which is a local chapter of National Cares Mentoring Movement. People can go and check that out at cares.org. I sit on a board for Brooklyn Cares Mentoring, but what we do is we connect um, able and willing Brown mentors with mentoring organizations so that we can mentor the underserved um, communities of Brooklyn, Brownsville, East New York, but not just those areas, but primarily that's where our focus is so that we can mentor these kids with life skills, uh, job opportunities. We send them mentors to their schools. We do group mentoring. And then we have this program called The Rising which is steeped in pillars of education, wellness, have gotten hurt numerous times on the job, numerous times. And with each injury, got worse. And with the last incident where I had to have surgery, one, they were not gonna put me back to full duty and you cannot work inside restricted for a certain amount of time. Like after a certain amount of time, it's like, if you're never gonna go back to full duty, meaning going back on the street, then they will survey you off or you can you know, ask to get an early retirement. So I got an early retirement. However, if I stayed on a job till my 20th, I would have retired uh, February, 2014. So I just got out a few years earlier. I was very fortunate. I still feel impacts of those incidences now. So I have like invisible disabilities. While serving as a rookie officer, Val gave birth to her daughter, Shelby. And Miriam enjoyed her time as auntie. I think everyone was kind of like excited. I personally, I was new on the job as a rookie. And I was just like, oh my God. But everyone was excited about Shelby coming and I actually have, like, pictures from the baby shower, (laughs) which was so cool. She was there, of course, you know, my mother, my sisters. And then it was like she's an auntie, again, because Amy had a son. So it wasn't her first, well, it was her first niece, but she wasn't an aunt first time. So Shelby was the first granddaughter, the first niece, and she was the first niece and the only niece for about 18 years. And then my sister had her daughter and Miriam had her daughter. And then she lived literally, like she moved into an apartment, literally right around the corner from me. So she was like, it was very convenient for me to just go to her house and walk around the corner. And and then when I was on a job, um, it was convenient to have her around the corner because in case You know, I needed a babysitter for Shelby. You know, she was there to support me, along with my mom. They had a really, really cool relationship. Um, Shelby kind of felt like Miriam was the cool aunt, you know, and because Miriam was younger than Amy. Amy is one year apart from me. So Miriam was more of the cool aunt to hang out with Shelby and She would come and pick Shelby up and take her out for the weekends over to her house. And they would do girl stuff. You know, walking in the New York City Halloween parade, dressed up in our costumes, or going to Fright Night um, for Halloween at Great Adventures. She had on a cat suit. She looked so cute. I had on a red she-devil outfit. And Shelby, my daughter, had a pink, I think it was a blonde wig with a pink boa. She wasn't like any specific character. And I think Shelby was probably around eight, maybe nine. And so, you know, as spectators, you're on this side of the 
But somehow, some way, I don't know, we were just like, we're going to be part of this parade. And we literally got in and started walking with the parade. And it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Miriam was a funny, she was funny. <laughs> she was corny. <laughs> she was funny. Was, she was like corny, dorky. Like, my daughter is a fashion designer. And, you know, during a time, like, Miriam got to come to, like, maybe two of Shelby's fashion shows. No. One. So 2013, she got to come to that fashion show, which is, you know, we had the show, I think, in August. But each year, Shelby, she's now up to the ninth show. Last year, we didn't do a show. But each year in August or September, we do a show. We've been doing them now in September for Fashion Week. And we decided we're not going to do a show this year again because of the C word. Um, (laughs) But we're going to do one next year. Even though Miriam helped Val by babysitting Shelby and supporting her as the cool auntie, she would often turn to Val to help her as she faced life's roller coasters. I think I'm protective of all my sisters. We talked about relationships. I definitely was like the advisor in her her longest lasting relationship, which is the one right before she had her daughter. Her ex-boyfriend used to call her me um sometimes because he would mimic Shelby because Shelby couldn't say Miriam. So Shelby would call her me um <laughs> And uh, her friends would call her M-I-C because her initials are M-I-C, Miriam Iris Carey. Well, when she was younger... My mother and my father used to call her Butterball, like the Butterball turkey. She was Butterball. And so I was like an advisor to her and her then guy. Yeah, whenever there was an issue, she would call me up and she was like, oh, this is, you know, what happened and what do you think? And so she would call me for advice. Um, We'd talk about recipes. (laughs) One piece of advice that Miriam took from Val was on home ownership but against Val's liking. It took Miriam out of the city and into Connecticut. When she then moved to Connecticut, um, she went and bought a condo out there, and that was only like a year prior to her passing. So she hadn't been a resident of Connecticut long. It wasn't a move that I co-signed or was even happy about, but Miriam really wanted home ownership, and she just wasn't, patient to go through the process of really finding something here in New York and Brooklyn and, you know, getting into Brooklyn real estate, it's very pricey. We lived in Bed-Stuy. We st- I still live here. Amy still lives here. So as far as affordability and the section of Connecticut where she lives at from my house here, it's only like 40 minutes away by a car. So it was still close to the city. And she got a certain ownership and lifestyle that she was looking for. She definitely wanted growth. So it was never like, I'm sitting on my laurels, I I made this. No, what's next? So she was in the process of starting her own business, such as like a temp agency or placement agency for other healthcare providers, I guess like In the dentistry realm, what she found as being a registered dental hygienist working in a dentist's office, sometimes they would be short-staffed. And so they would go through a temp agency to have someone come in to fill a spot. She realized that there was a need, literally was in the process of like creating her own staffing in the dentistry realm. She didn't talk a lot about it, but enough that I knew that it was in process, you know? And I think that, you know, she was inspired, like, whereas you have a position, you have a job, but you don't necessarily have to stop there. At this point, I was already retired as a sergeant, but I then, I don't want to say reinvented myself, but I was transitioning into my entrepreneurship where um, I was doing several different things. I was doing... You know, my menstrual work, I'm a menstrual maven, and I have a company, TLTM, which is a menstrual wellness company. 
also was doing real estate as an investor. So she saw the entrepreneurship there, which is why I was so not happy with the move. It's like, be patient. We could find you something here. She was determined. That's the best way that I could say it. She was determined. When she set her sights on something and she wanted something, it was, okay, let's let's move. And if it wasn't moving to the speed that she wanted it to move, it's like, I'm going to I'm going to fast track this. <laughs> so I guess I wasn't moving fast enough. Then something unexpected happened. Interestingly enough, she didn't know she was pregnant until she had an accident. She had fallen down a flight of stairs. She was injured. I was in Las Vegas when this happened and I got the phone call and I was like, oh, my God. They were like, no, you don't have to fly back now because I was going to be back in like two days. But. So in the midst of her being hospitalized, she had a a head injury. This was early 2012. And and so that's when she found out she was pregnant. She didn't know. We all found out. It was like, and so now she's going through a pregnancy with a back injury, which wasn't good. I was um, surprised. It was definitely a surprise. because the person that she was with, she wasn't with them long. I mean, babies are definitely blessings. So it doesn't matter who they actually come from. So, of course, um, we were happy as a family to know that she was going to have her first child. My niece was born on the same day of my mother's birthday. But she's pregnant at the same time that Amy, like their pregnancies overlap. Well, the baby came early, er, than um, expected, and because of the injuries, I was happy to know that I had a niece, a second niece, <laughs> because Amy had just had her baby a few months earlier. So then I had two nieces. She was she was happy. She was happy to be a mother. You know, she had a little girl who looks just like her and has hair just like her. And okay, so hair in, in certain cultures is like, it's your crown. And growing up, it was always this thing like, oh, you know, they have such pretty hair. And like, oh God, <laughs> you know, and then there's a comparison because there's five of us. And, well, her hair is curly and her hair was, short. like my youngest sister's hair was like very wavy and curly. And then, you know, you ha- then you have ignorance. So, well, do you all have the same father? Yes, we do have the same father. Even if we didn't, that's neither here nor here, but we did. In certain cultures, hair is really important. So when I say, you know, her daughter has the same hair, I think some people could kind of relate to what I'm saying. But yeah, her daughter looks just like her and um, she's beautiful. Miriam was excited. Miriam was excited about having a, gr- a daughter and Amy having a daughter. And it was like, and then I had my two nieces, you know, it's like, okay. Yeah, I thought when I had Christian, like Christian's my nephew and and people would think he was my son, like even to this day. (laughs) So like, I just saw another generation, like another segment, like these two little girls, I'm going to take them together. We're going to do so much stuff because auntie, so there was this thing, who's the best auntie? (laughs) Who's the best auntie? But, um, you know, unfortunately, right now, Amy's daughter, Naima, is missing out on her cousin, which is very sad. Miriam Carey, outgoing, kind-hearted, entrepreneur, sister, and mother to her one-year-old daughter, took a drive to Washington, D.C. on October 3rd, 2013. The events of this day are ones the Carey family never imagined could happen, and especially not to their family. So the day started out for me, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say that was a Thursday. I was supposed to host an event 
And I was getting ready in my office. That was a Thursday. So I was getting ready in my office, (sighs) preparing for this event that I was hosting. And I remember my laptop being open to the AOL page. I did see the headline, but didn't click on the story because I was focused. And my phone started to blow up, so to speak, with all of these different numbers that were not registered in my phone. So I'm like, if you're not registered in my phone, you're going to go to voicemail. I'll listen to it later. But the frequency, the amount of calls that came in, it just came in one after the next. And I was like, Like, I don't understand what's happening right now. Like, and then I saw a number that appeared to be a Connecticut number. And I thought, maybe perhaps this is my sister. Even though I have her number programmed in my phone. But I'm like, maybe she, you know, something happened to her cell phone and she's someplace and she's calling me. So that was the only reason why I answered the call. And when I answered the call, it was a was a reporter. He identified himself as a reporter from Connecticut, wanted to know if my sister was in Washington. I didn't know her to be in Washington that day, but that's neither here nor there. And then he, you know, continued with his line of questioning, like, what type of car does she drive? And I was just like, it got to the point where I was like, where is this going? What are you trying to say to me? And he said, well, obviously you haven't been watching the news. Turn your TV on to CNN. And then when I turned my TV on to CNN, I see the footer running, suspect, suspect of what? Um, I see my niece being held by an officer. I do see my sister's vehicle or what appeared to could be my sister's vehicle. And I just got off the phone and said, I need to process this. Just getting a look now at new eyewitness video of much of the car chase. It started near the White House and ended on Capitol Hill. The cops opened fire. This is near uh, Capitol Hill. I want you to watch this. These are police officers. You're going to hear some... Oh. You're going to hear some gunshots. About seven gunshots. The woman in the coupe keeps driving. You see her car. That's the car zooming. So in that instance, she's in Washington, D.C., or it appears as if she's in Washington, D.C. I'm assuming, I know we're not supposed to make assumptions, but because no one has given me any facts up to this point, but from what I can see, I see a vehicle on the TV that appears to be my sister's vehicle. I clearly see my niece. I see what is being ran as the story, you know, footer, headline. I'm confused. And thinking from a law enforcement perspective, I'm like, okay, whatever is happening, this is not good. I need to gather my family together and they need to get to my house. And then I called my mom and then my mom was screaming because they had already called her reporters. And, And then my husband took the phone and spoke to my mom And then immediately then I was like, I am, this is going to be a shit storm. That's exactly what I said in my head. As Val gathered her family, the breaking news began to spread all over the country. Her sister, Miriam Carey, was indeed in Washington, D.C. and had been chased down by Capitol Police, Secret Service, and a host of other law enforcement agents and officers after she allegedly took a wrong turn into a White House security checkpoint barrier. Miriam was shot five times in the back, including once in the back of her head, all while her infant daughter was in the back seat of the car. I'm thinking, where's my sister? I'm calling her. What, what's happening? Still trying to process this. Special thank you to the family of Miriam Carey. We appreciate you for listening to Say Their Name courtesy of DCP Entertainment, as well as special thanks to our team, host and executive producers Adele Coleman and myself, Chris Colbert, 
Producers Heather Johnson, Ryan Woodhall, and Mike DuBose. Associate producer Quentin Hill. And editor and sound designer Byron Hunt. Join us next week for part two on Miriam Carey. She's in her car. What was she doing? Was she in a commission of a crime? Did she have a gun? I know she doesn't have a registered gun. She didn't have a gun. She wasn't in a commission of a crime. Sitting, talking to the FBI, Secret Service, and making phone calls, trying to still figure things out. Can you tell me if that was my sister in the car? <laughs>